So today we are going to finish discussing the play. Our discussion questions. One. Do you think that Oedipus accuses Tiresias of conspiracy, but immediately believes the shepherd? And if so, why? Two, what do you think is the purpose of the fifth choral song? How can you tell? Three, do you think the bloody action all happens off stage? And if so, why? Four, the last lines of the play urge us to call no person happy who has not traveled all through life without experiencing any pain. Do you think this is the main theme of the play? Why or why not? Five, this play has been called one of the first detective stories. Do you agree why or why not? Let's start with one. Page 45. OK, so. Here Oedipus is questioning the shepherd, the herdsman. About uh, where. He got the baby that he saved on the mountain. Um, So uh, step by step, he Oedipus gets the truth out of him. Uh, it's one of the babies born to Laius. Uh, and when Oedipus asks, ah, so one of the babies born to Laius, this means the baby belongs to Laius. So it could be a slave or it could be his own kid, his own child. Kin means family. And so when Oedipus asks this question, the shepherd points out that this answer could be dangerous, right? Uh, but Oedipus says, I must hear the truth. And so the shepherd's answer is, it was Laius's son. And that Jocasta, uh, gave the baby to the shepherd. Why did she give the baby to the shepherd? So that he could kill the baby. So in ancient Greece, if for any reason they need needed to kill a newborn baby, the usual way to do this is to abandon the baby somewhere in the wild and let them die naturally. Uh, in that way, you can't say that they killed the baby, right? The baby died naturally because if you kill another person, even a baby, that's a crime. So it's like a loophole. You didn't follow your load on down. So this is what happened to Lias's baby. And why did uh, they want to kill the baby? because of a prophecy. What was the prophecy? That the child would kill his parents. So up to now, we have connected the story of this abandoned baby to the story of Oedipus. He also was, we, we have learned earlier in the play, he also was discovered in the wild. Uh, he also has a prophecy saying that he would kill his father. Um, and so Oedipus's last question to the shepherd is, OK, you were ordered to abandon the baby, so why did you give it to the old man? Uh, the old man who discovered Oedipus in the wild. And the herdsman says, in pity. So now that the two stories fit together and Oedipus realizes it is him, it is he himself 
who was that baby. And therefore he is the son of Laius and Jocasta. Uh, his reaction. Oh, oh, everything now comes clear. I'm revealed as who I am. The child of parents who should not have had a child. So now Oedipus finally understands the whole truth about his life. But notice that uh, when he's asking the herdsman, everything the herdsman says, Oedipus immediately accepts, right? He has no questions about uh, what the herdsman says. But when we compare this to the first time he was asking questions, when he was asking Tiresias, to share the knowledge of prophecy, and Tiresias says no, and Oedipus says, um, like, you must be working with Creon to overthrow me. And then Tiresias says, it's you, Oedipus, who killed Laius. And Oedipus wouldn't believe him. So the answer to the first part of this question seems to be yes, Oedipus immediately believes the shepherd. But why? What is different about these two situations? Well, first of all, uh, we are now near the end of the play, so Oedipus is full of knowledge that fits with the herdsman's testimony. It all makes sense. It all fits together. Whereas at the beginning, Tiresias was the first person he questioned. Uh, so with no other evidence, no other reason to believe him, it if his simply felt that Tiresias was not making sense. Maybe he had a reason to oppose Oedipus. The second reason could be because the herdsman is a slave. We talked about this last time. People who work in his house are usually not paid workers, they're slaves. Uh, and as we saw when he was questioning the old man, uh, if a slave refuses to answer, he can be tortured. Whereas Tiresias is a free man. And as a free man, he could also maybe want to try to gain more power. So there it's two different situations and it's also two different kinds of people. So we can say that the whole play, the development of the whole play has been leading to this moment when Oedipus finally accepts the truth. It's not the first time that he has been told that he is the person. Uh, last week, we talked about whether he should have stopped asking questions at this point or the next point or the next point. Um, but every time he had, he, as the person who has to know the truth, he could not stop asking questions. So that kind of person, in that kind of situation seems to always lead to this kind of tragic ending. And that's part of what we mean when we say that something is a tragedy. It's not just sad. There are many things in life that are sad. It's that the way the situation happens and the people involved in the situation seem to lead only to one ending, the bad ending. And that's why we call it a tragedy. <clears throat> OK, do you have questions about number one? All right, let's move on to number two, the fifth choral song. Here. <clears throat> so this is the last time that the chorus will be singing um, 
separate from the story. So we remember the last few choral songs. The chorus is talking about what just happened, how normal people might think about this situation and what might happen in the future. So let's see what they sing about this last time in the play. This is right after Oedipus learns the truth. Oh, generations of mortals, I count you as equal to nothing, even when you are alive. So generations of mortals, which means like uh, throughout history, all of these people who have lived before. And it says, I count you as equal to nothing. Like there's no value to this history or these people. And then this third line uh, expands the meaning. It's not just history, but also the people who are alive today. We can think about this. What value does history have? Uh, the most direct answer is that we are supposed to learn from history. Things that happened in the past can guide us in the future. But here it says that what happened in the past has no value for what is happening right now. So one way to understand this is what is happening to Oedipus is unprecedented. So history cannot help him. Let's continue. Who indeed, what man, ever wins more good fortune than just enough to give an appearance, a show, then slip down? So this question means uh, that most people don't really have good fortune. They have just enough good fortune to look like they have good fortune. So this is also talking about Oedipus. At the beginning of the play, he's the king, the savior, the hero of the city. It seems like there's nothing that he can't do. But after a single day, right? This play takes place over a single day. He loses everything. He loses his kingdom. He loses his wife. His he's going to lose his children by the end of the play. Uh, he's going to lose his eyes. He's going to pluck out his own eyes. Uh, and then he's going to go into exile. So from the best position to the worst position in a single day. Uh, when we think about good fortune, one way we think about it is as uh, to, it helps us um, right? If we have good fortune, it's not easy for things to go wrong for us. Uh, but here, Oedipus has the best fortune, but in a single day loses everything. So this good fortune probably is, we, we can't say that it really is good fortune. It's just an appearance, a show to your white belt. Let's continue. You, poor Oedipus, you. I hold the god of your story, yours, yours as example, and I count no mortal happy. Let's look at what the footnote says. Ah, so the god of your story, it uses the word diamond, but di you may notice that this word resembles the English word demon. Uh, which means an evil spirit. But in ancient Greece, a diamond, as it says here, was simply a divine force that controls individual destiny. It doesn't have to be good or bad. It's simply what makes you follow your fate or your destiny. So if this is Oedipus's destiny, if this is what happens to him, then the diamond, which is here translated as God, uh, is responsible for that fate. So this is what the chorus is singing. 
uh, I hold the God of your story as example. And I count no mortal happy. If this fate could happen to someone as great as you, then nobody is truly happy. Nobody is truly safe. Nobody can defend against changing fate. Let's continue. You shot your arrow far beyond and mastered good fortune, good blessings in everything. So this is expanding on what we first thought of as Oedipus's good fortune. You shot your arrow far beyond. So this is a metaphor. It's uh, talking about how Oedipus won his good fortune. And remember, he won his good fortune by answering the riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, we talked about this riddle last week. And uh, the punishment for getting the wrong answer is death. So this kind of attempt is far beyond what a normal person would be willing to try. But by taking this big risk, he did master good fortune, good blessings in everything. Yes, by Zeus, you destroyed the girl with the twisted talons who sang riddling omens. So this is describing the Sphinx. The Sphinx is uh, usually described as a woman uh, or as female. Talons is the sharp part of a bird's hands, the ying zua. Uh, a riddle is uh, mi yu. And then omens are like so like a prophecy. So uh, the Sphinx said that if you, you get the answer wrong, you die. But if you get the answer right, I die. And so when Oedipus got the right answer, he destroyed the Sphinx. You stood against our deaths as a tower for my land. A tower is a high uh, building, Gautha. So this is describing how Oedipus was welcomed as a hero after destroying the Sphinx. From that time onward, you were called my king and you have received the greatest of honors, ruling in this the greatest of cities in Thebes. Right, so after destroying the Sphinx, he became king. So this stanza is talking about how Oedipus won his good fortune. But now, who now have you heard of more deeply unhappy in troubles more savage who lives with such terrible change in his life? Right, like this big change in his fortune from the top to the bottom. Who else has experienced this? Nobody. Oh, famous, infamous Oedipus. Ah, this is a great line. So he's famous for doing all of those great things, but now he's infamous, Ming uh, Zhangde, for doing all of those terrible things. And so in the same line, it puts together his good fortune and his bad fortune. His fortune changes so quickly from good to bad, just like in this line, it goes from famous immediately to infamous. It changes just like that. Uh, across one comma, everything is different. The same mighty harbor, Gangho, was enough for both you and your father as slaves of the bedroom to fall in the same. So in this image, the harbor is a metaphor for Jocasta. So both Oedipus and his father are slaves of the bedroom. And they fall in the same harbor. So this is talking about how Jocasta is both Oedipus's mother, wife of Laius, and Oedipus's wife, so they have both slept with the same woman. Uh, the use of a harbor 
Ganko to describe Jocasta is connected to something we talked about two weeks ago. Uh, we talked about an idea called the ship of state, comparing the country to a ship and the king to a captain. So if the king is a captain, then the captain, when the captain goes home to safety, he goes to a harbor, right? So Oedipus goes as the king goes home to his wife, Jocasta. Therefore, the harbor is Jocasta. How on earth could those furrows, your fathers, how could they bear you for so long in silence, poor man? So this is using another image to describe Jocasta, a furrow. Tian, tian gen. Uh, in ancient Greece, you often see um, a man and a woman having sex described as planting seeds in a furrow or tilling the field. Uh, so uh, here, the, the furrow itself is describing Jocasta, right? It's your father's furrow. How could they bear you for so long in silence? In other words, how could something so unnatural happen and nobody know, nobody call out? Time can see everything. Time found you out, though you did not want it. Uh, very quickly, I want to talk about this phrase to find you out. find. Uh, find out. Find out right? To find or to find out. To find means to, to learn. To find out means to work hard to discover. But to find someone out means to reveal someone. So it's a different phrase. Though you did not want it. Time brings to justice your long ago parented parenting. To bring someone to justice or bring something to justice. In Chinese, we call this Huanrenjiaqingbai. Uh, was it was it Si Zen Yi? Uh, Oedipus is parented parenting. Again, the same woman is both mother and wife. Marriage, unmarriage. Right, they did get married, but naturally they should not have gotten married. This is using the same trick as above, right? Famous, infamous. Uh, the next word is the complete opposite. That's how fast things are changing for Oedipus. Child of Laius, I wish how I wish that I never had seen you. And this idea is when someone is cursed, it's also bad luck or a kind of pollution, uran. Uh, to see the person, to talk with the person. So now the chorus is saying, I wish I never saw you. How intensely I mourn you and pour from my mouth a cry of deep grief. So Oedipus is still alive. So why is the chorus mourning him? Was they're mourning Oedipus the king, not Oedipus the person. Now that Oedipus's life has changed so much, he is no longer the same person. So they are mourning the original Oedipus. To tell truth, from you I took breath, and through you I rock to sleep my eyes. So this is describing what the chorus has lost. They have lost their hero. They have lost the person that they could depend on, right? Because Oedipus lived and protected them, they could breathe easily and they could sleep easily. 
but now they the whole city has lost this kind of uh, comfort and protection. So that's the choral song. What is it talking about? First, it's saying uh, this huge change in Oedipus's life means that no good fortune is really good fortune. Nobody is safe. It talks about how Oedipus gained uh, honor and then how Oedipus lost honor. And finally, the effect of this change on the people. It began by saying no person is safe. Now it says we have lost our safety, our comfort, our protection. So it's a kind of summary of the entire play. But it's not just summarizing what we have read. Throughout the play, we have been following Oedipus's perspective, the perspective of the king. This song gives us the people's perspective. Throughout the whole play, the chorus has been on stage in the circle part, the orchestra, so they know everything that happened. They may not care about every single detail. Uh, to them, the important thing is the result, the truth. And the truth is that the person they trusted the most is no longer trustworthy. The person that protected them can no longer protect them. So it's a tragedy for Oedipus, but it's also a tragedy for the city. Oedipus killed their original king, and now he as the new king is also going to leave. Thebes is not a democracy, so their king is supposed to rule for a long time. But now within the span of a few years, they have lost two kings and been through a plague. People have died. People have lost their true their trust in religion and society. So it's also a tragedy for the city. OK, do you have questions about number two? OK, let's move on to number three. The bloody action. So uh, at the end of the choral song, as we just saw, a second messenger comes in from the palace. So he appears from the middle of the skinny and enters the stage. As a messenger, of course, he's going to deliver a message. So what does he say? Queen Jocasta is dead. So that's his message, that Jocasta is dead. How did she die? She killed herself. So remember last week we saw Jocasta leave the stage and she said that she will never say anything again. Now we know why because she was planning to kill herself. So this already happened. We, we don't get to see it. We only learn about it because the second messenger describes it for us. And she in fury came inside the hall. She dashed, which means ran quickly toward her marriage bed, her fingers ripping out her hair. Remember, we talked about last time ripping out your hair is a sign of grief and mourning, terrible sadness. She slammed the doors shut from the inside. Uh, and then she cried out in pain. She cried out to Elias. How after that she died, I do not know. So even the messenger does not know how Jocasta killed herself. But Oedipus, after he left the stage, uh, this is what he did. The messenger also tells us what he did. He burst in. Uh, he asked us for a sword. 
and where could he find his mother? Oh, this is fun. Where his wife, not wife, his mother. So now he also is as confused as everybody else. Then he goes to the double doors of his bedroom with Jocasta. Uh, he that he destroyed the doors from their sockets bent and twisted those doors. The socket is uh, like, you know, you know how a door works, right? Socket. So he he basically rips the door from the socket. He destroys the doors. Falls inside the room. And there he saw Jocasta hanging from a twisted noose. A noose, this word is used especially for the loop that you tie with a rope in order to hang someone. That thing is called a noose. OK, so Jocasta dies, but we don't get to see it. This happens off stage. Uh, he then Oedipus takes down her body. Then he ripped the spikes of beaten gold she wore out of her clothing. A spike of beaten gold. Uh, a spike is it's something sharp. So uh, in ancient Greece, when a woman is wearing like a cloth or a toga or her clothing, it's like a, a big robe and it's pinned together using a spike like this one. Uh, if you've ever seen someone from ancient Rome or ancient Greece, they don't wear like shirts or pants, right? They wear like one big cloth tied around their body, but it's not tied, it's pinned. Yung tingde, yung tingde. And she's a queen, so the spike is made of gold. So Oedipus takes down her body, takes the spike out of her clothing. He held them up and then struck the sockets of his own round eyes. So he uses the spike to stab his own eyes. Shouting about how they would not see her nor what bad things he did and underwent. How for the future they would see in darkness those he should not have seen. They would not know those he should not have known. Uh, the idea here is he saw things he should not have seen. He learned things he should not have learned. We talked about how in this play seeing the idea of sight is connected to the idea of learning. So now that he has learned something he should not have learned, he also does not want to see anymore. And so he stabs out his eyes. But again, we don't see this. The messenger tells us. Uh, and this is very bloody, right? Look like look at this. He used the spikes to pummel at his eyes. To pummel means to keep hitting. So he doesn't stab his eyes once, right? Not once, but many times. And as he did so, his bloody eyeballs drenched his cheeks. Right? Uh, they flowed continually. It's like this is a really bloody scene, but we don't see it. We only hear it. And in fact, some people might say this makes it even bloodier because we imagine it. it it's whatever we might see on stage what we imagine is could be far worse. Uh, and so that's one reason why the bloody action all happens off stage. It makes it more powerful, uh, more bloody, more scary. But another reason is because uh, ancient Greek tragedy and drama is focused on the people, 
and the dialogue, the conversation, the words. Right, it uses poetry. It's not as focused on the special effects. There were one or two playwrights who did create some special effects. Uh, for instance, the playwright Euripides was famous for using a special effect to bring the gods into the play. Right in this play, there are no gods. Right? People call to Apollo, um, but Apollo doesn't appear himself. But in Euripides, sometimes a god or goddess does appear. And how do they appear? From the sky. And so he created a kind of special effect called it's, it's a machine to to uh, lower the actor from a high place. It's a machine. So the effect was called God from the machine. In Latin, it's called Deus ex machina. And we still use this in English today. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Ji Xie Sen. Not exactly correct, but it's what we do. We call it in Chinese. Today, uh, a Deus Ex Machina doesn't have to be an actual God. It just means that the solution to the problem, the ending of the play, comes from nowhere. It's not a reasonable ending. It's something that the author adds just to solve the situation. So uh, it could be a god suddenly appears. It could be a special character, not a god, but someone who has all the answers suddenly appears. It could be the main character suddenly discovers something that will help him solve all of the problems. Right, all of these today would be called Deus Ex Machina. So that's uh, one of the few kinds of special effects that ancient Greek theater used, but mostly no effects. So how do you perform something so bloody? You can't, you can only talk about it. So that's the other reason why this happens off stage. Questions? Okay, let's move on to question four. The last lines of the play. So the play ends with the chorus. The chorus represents the people of Thebes. Uh, so they give us the conclusion to the play. Let's look at what they say, or I guess what they sing. Inhabitants of Thebes, our fatherland, look here. So in other words, the audience pay attention. This Oedipus who solved the famous riddle and was most powerful, who never glanced at the citizens envy. Uh, so which means that uh, he's powerful, he's famous, he's rich. So of course, some people would envy him with but he never paid them any attention, didn't even glance at them. Then uh, so he never envy, uh, he never glanced at envy or at fortune. So when other people envy him, he didn't pay attention. When other people had better fortune than him, he didn't pay attention. This Oedipus has now collided with this great tsunami of ruin. Now I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the word tsunami is not the word they used in Greece. Uh, I guess the word they use is a great wave, a big wave. Um, so this Oedipus has now met his ruin. And not just met, right? Collided with. 
it's so sudden and so powerful and terrifying. So therefore the conclusion. All mortals ought to look toward this final day. Ought to means they should. To look toward does not just mean look at. It means expect, anticipate. And call no person happy who has not traveled all through life without experiencing any pain. So in plain English, this is if someone has not experienced all of life, including the pain of life, we cannot call that person happy. So you have to experience everything in life in order to be truly happy. Do you think that is what this play is saying? Is this the main theme of the play? You have to experience everything in order to be happy. I think it's kind of weird. Because Oedipus is the person who has experienced everything from the highest high to the lowest low, but he ends the play incredibly unhappy. In fact, he was happier before he learned the truth and the pain of the truth. So how can we say that only by experience traveling through all of life and experiencing the joy and the pain, can you be happy? Can you be called happy? It's a very strange ending. So if it's not the main theme of the play, why does the chorus end the play by saying this? Remember throughout this play, the chorus has been reacting to events, trying to make sense of what they learn. Maybe this is one final attempt to make sense of life, even though something so terrible and unreasonable could happen to someone as great and powerful as Oedipus. It's kind of like the plague, right? If you can't believe in religion, you can't trust the government, there's no meaning in life. There's nothing you can depend on in life. Same here. If you can't believe in your hero, if you can't trust that your hero will always protect you, how should you understand life? And so, Perhaps the chorus is trying to make sense out of this senseless life. And the way that it does this is to look at what happened and try to find a way to make it make sense. Yes, Oedipus suffers terribly because he learns everything and he experiences everything, so he's not really happy. But it is also true that other people have warned him not to keep asking questions. It's he himself who could not stop asking questions. So in one sense, he's not really. Uh, like the experiences in his life were not there for him to travel through. <laughs> 他最后得到真理的过程，其实是有重重阻碍的。那本来不是他应该走的道路，是因为他自己个性使然，才要一直走下去。So Oedipus would seem to be the exception to the rule of this conclusion, right? If we look at what the chorus is saying, it makes sense if you don't try to apply it to the play. For everybody else, it's true. You have to experience everything in life in order to truly call yourself happy or to truly know what happiness is. It's true for everyone except for Oedipus. He is the one conclusion or with the one exclusion, the one exception. So in this case, we would say that Oedipus is the exception that proves the rule. 
this saying in English uh, is very interesting because only English has this idea that every rule is only a good rule if there is at least one exception. In most other cultures around the world, if there is a big exception to a rule, then it's not a rule, right? It doesn't apply to everything. But in the culture of English speaking societies like England, Australia, the US, people often believe that no single idea or no single rule can guide you through all of life. Life changes constantly, and you also have to adapt to these changes. So if someone gives you a rule and says no exceptions, it's always true, then it can't be a real rule. It can't be useful. Only when a rule has exceptions can you depend on the rule generally. <laughs> 单一一条规则是可以定义整个人生。那当有人跟你讲说这规则是万用的，没有例外，那就不应该相信。一定是有例外的规则才值得信赖，因为你知道例外是什么，其他时间你就可以依赖这个规则。这是英语世界国家比较
so the chorus can only try to make some sense out of what has happened. And that's also, uh, I guess you can call this also another way that this play is a tragedy and that there's no way to make sense of it. Uh, even at the ending, where the conclusion is supposed to give us the meaning of the play, it can't. The chorus doesn't know what to say. So they offer some banality, some cliche, you know, about life instead of talking about the play. OK, question five. A detective story. Well, let's think about this. In a detective story, usually the detective is also part of the story. Uh, very rarely do you have a situation where someone goes to the detective, the detective listens, and then the detective gives you the answer. End of story. It's usually much more complicated than that, right? Usually the detective will have to go and find clues, find evidence, talk to people. And by looking for clues themselves and talking to people in person, the detective involves themselves in the story. They are no longer outside of the story. Like for example, when the detective talks to suspects, Shen Yifan, the suspects know that he's a detective. Um, so the suspects therefore know that somebody is trying to find the truth. So that changes what these characters do, how they prepare. Uh, so the te detective is usually part of the story also. Oedipus is not just part of the story, he ends up being the center of the story. When the play begins, uh, he's simply trying to discover who killed Laius in order to end the plague. He did not expect that he himself would become part of his own investigation. But as it slowly turns out that he killed Laius, he then is desperate to know why he killed Laius why or how fate and Apollo have put him in that position. And so it the the answer to who killed Laius then becomes tied up with why did Oedipus kill Laius? And the answer to that has to do with the prophecy about his birth. And so Oedipus's whole life story becomes the central uh, plot of this play. The detective becomes involved in the story. So that's one way that Oedipus Tyrannos is similar to a detective story. Another point is that the play proceeds by letting Oedipus discover more and more information. In most stories, the progression of the story, how it moves forward, is when somebody does something or when situations change or when relationships change. Only in a detective story is the plot about somebody learning something, learning clues, learning how the truth might have happened. This is what the play is. Oedipus learning more and more about the truth. First, he learns the answer from Tiresias, but doesn't believe him. Then he uh, learns that Creon did not uh, make a conspiracy against him. Then he learns from an old slave that uh, he is not the biological son of his father in the city of Corinth. The person he thought was his father is not actually his biological father. Then he learns that he was discovered as a baby in the wild. Then he learns that uh, 
Jocasta's child was abandoned as a baby in the wild. And so when he puts together all of this information, he realizes that he the, the, tr the real story of his life is he was abandoned as a baby, was raised by the king of the city of Corinth. When he heard the prophecy that he would kill his father and marry his mother, he left home to prevent it from happening. On the road, he meets the Sphinx, answers the riddle, and thereby saves the city of Thebes, becomes the king of Thebes, marries the queen of Thebes, who is his mother. And on the road, he runs into an old man and his servants um, who try to run over him, so he kills them in self-defense. That old man was Laius, his father and the king of Thebes. So by leaving his home to try to avoid the prophecy, he actually makes the prophecy come true. In English, we call this a self-fulfilling prophecy. It only works if you try to avoid it. It's kind of a paradox, right? It only works when you try to avoid it. Uh, probably the most famous self-fulfilling prophecy that you know is in Harry Potter. Voldemort hears the prophecy that somebody born on some day will end up defeating him. So he goes to the home of that family and tries to kill that baby before it grows up, but the spell uh, rebounds on himself and he himself is almost killed. But it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because uh, when the prophecy said a baby born on that day, turns out there were two babies born on the same day. So by choosing Harry Potter, Voldemort helps to fulfill that prophecy. By trying to avoid that prophecy, he ends up fulfilling it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, in detective stories, something like this sometimes can happen. It's not a part of detective stories, um, but especially in like film noir, Hesa Ding, where the detective uh, enters a very messy situation. Nobody is really right. Everybody is wrong in a different way. Uh, many times when the detective tries to discover the truth, it ends up making the truth even messier or when they try to save the good guy, it ends up killing the good guy, something like that. Once the detective becomes involved in the story, every, all bets are off. Right? Anything the detective does could have uh, unintentional consequences. So in that sense, Oedipus could also be considered a specific kind of detective story. And of course, it's one of the earliest stories in Western literature. At least I can't think of an earlier detective story, but for sure it's one of the earliest. But of course, today when we think about detective stories, Usually the person is a professional detective or a professional investigator, somebody whose job is to find out the truth. Oedipus is a king. A king, you know, you would expect would have people they could send to investigate. They don't have to do it themselves. But because he cares so much about his people, because his people trust him as a savior and a protector, so he decides to look for the truth himself. So that's one of the main differences between the play and a modern detective story. Questions?
By the way, do you know who invented the modern detective story? Like the one with the the professional investigator and the crime and like being involved in the story. The inventor of the modern detective story is not Arthur Conan Doyle, being was a Conan Dar for It's Edgar Allan Poe, it's Island Poe. Do you, have you guys heard of? Well, yes, you have, because last semester we read his poem, The Raven. We are right. The one that said nevermore, my my dear Lenore, that one. Uh, so in the 19th century, he invented this kind of story. Uh, I think it was called uh, the the affair of the Rue Morgue or something. So in the very first detective, modern detective story, all of the elements were already there. Uh, Alan Poe's detective is a guy sitting at home. The police come to ask him for help. He gets involved and the answer turns out to be something that is already close to the detective. It's not something separate. So all of what we've just been talking about already appeared in Alan Poe's first detective story. It's quite interesting. OK, let's go back to the beginning of this week's selection. And uh, we'll talk about this in more detail. Well,昨天前天在学校帮忙做那个真是入学面试。你们有些人应该还记得这过程吧? 今年蛮特别的，就是因为疫情关系，我们把那个空间限缩在西上既有的教室，就是英国茶文化教室跟美国文化教室。所以意思是说，就是有些就是你们未来的学弟妹，他们的面试地点就是坐在那个就是英式下
the approaching herdsman while talking to the first messenger. New, more complicated situations. So he asked the messenger, I'll ask you first, is this the man you mean? From Corinth? Corinth is Oedipus's old home where he grew up. First messenger, yes, he is the one you see. Okay, so now we're sure this shepherd is the right guy. He should have the answers. Now you, old man, look here and answer all my questions. Look here does not mean look at me. In English, look here means pay attention. Did you once belong to Laius? So are you a slave of Laius? Do you work for Laius? Yes, not a bot slave raised up in that house. So he's a slave, but he wasn't bought. He was born to another slave uh, in the same house. What was your line of work or way of life? See, this sounds like a policeman interrogating a witness, right? Who are you? What do you do? How did you appear at the crime scene? What is your relation to the suspect? Right, these background questions. It's like a detective story. So what did you do? What was your line of work? Most of my life was following the herds. Muyang, Yang Ching, herd is uh Dong Wu Ching. So he has been a herdsman all his life. And in what places did you mostly shelter? So I, I don't know if you understand the job of a shepherd or a herdsman. They don't just like take care of the sheep during the day. Often sheep will travel across the entire grazing area. They might move between seasons. You they're not like horses, right? For a horse, you let them out during the day and then you bring them back at night. Sheep are out for like days or weeks, even months at a time. Um, depending on how much grass is in the area, how much they can eat and the weather. Uh, like how much they can graze. Graze is just, just uh, that's the word for it to graze. So if you're a shepherd, you don't go home every day. You have to stay with your sheep and guard your sheep. So at night you have to find somewhere to sleep. You have to find shelter. Uh, here the word shelter is used as a verb. Uh, Oedipus, when he's asking this, is basically asking where do your sheep usually graze? Either Cithern or else thereabouts. Thereabouts means nearby. So either on Mount Cithern or near Mount Cithern. Oedipus already knows that this is where he as a baby was discovered. Next, so did you meet this man there? Do you know him? Uh, the herdsman, how would I? Doing what? Who do you mean? Zhuang Sun. This man here, did you ever interact? So uh, Oedipus is now pointing to the first messenger. Uh, did you ever interact? Right. This is again like the police questioning a suspect or questioning a witness. Do you know this man? When did you last talk to him? That kind of question. So did you ever interact? Herzman, well, not so I could call to mind right now. To call to mind means remember. So I don't remember. First messenger, it's not surprising, master, but I will remind him. 
这个人就是状况怪的、啊。哎，那个牧羊人知道说 ，it is 这样问，就是快要接近真相了，然后真相对大家都不好。可是这个 first messenger 他是从 Corinth 来的，他完全不了解状况，所以人家问他什么，他就答什么。那有点小小的蠢。So when The herdsman says, "I don't remember." The first messenger is like, "Oh, I'll help you remember." I know well he does remember. When on Sitheran's land he drove two flocks, and I drove one. The word "drive" here uh, means "trigan." The word "drive" originally means uh, like to, like like I said, "trigan," right? To to Move animals around, basically. Um, it only became to drive a car because what you do in a car moves the car around. You're making the car move. Uh, there's one other meaning of the word drive in golf, garfucho. When you hit the ball, the verb for hitting the ball is called drive. You drive the ball. Because you make the ball move. Otherwise, in golf, the ball is never supposed to move. So you drove two flocks, uh, two herds, liang chun yang, and I drove one. I was his neighbor for three whole six month seasons. From the spring till Arcturus was rising. Arcturus is a star. Zika hung xing. Uh, and when Arcturus rises, it means that autumn is coming, fall is coming. Or, sorry, winter is coming. It's already fall. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. Um, so they were neighbors six months, three times. So like when the herdsman says, I don't know this person, it, he's obviously lying, right? You spend three, 就是连续三四六个月都跟这个人相处，你怎么可能不认得他吗 ？Even after many years. Then at winter, I drove my flocks to my own fold, while he drove his to Lias's stables. A fold is another word for a valley, sangku. So the idea is that sheep. The best grass uh, is on on the side of the mountains. So during the spring and summer, they would graze on the side of the mountains. And then during winter, uh, you would drive your sheep to the valleys where they would not suffer from the cold wind. Uh, and they would sleep and live in the valley during the winter. Uh, While the herdsman drove his to Lias's stables, stable is uh, 马厩，这边应该就是羊厩。Am I telling the truth or not in saying all this happened?、Uh, and、uh, since it is true, the herdsman has to say, "You're right. It's true." And then he tries to defend himself, though all of this was long ago. The idea is like so, you know, it's it's natural. I might forget. It's so long ago. Uh, so they have established that the herdsman is the guy they should be talking to. Your adventurer, and then you can ask key questions. And notice that the person asking is not Oedipus. It's the first messenger who asks. He doesn't know what's going on. He simply thinks that he's helping the king. Uh, 人生常这样，你自己要小心。那个帮人家可能会让自己倒霉，你要要留意一下。不是说不不能帮啊，但是你要清楚说你帮的时候那个效果是什么。So come on, 来吧来吧 ，Tell us, do you know you gave a child to me? To bring up as my own,、uh, the answer should be yes. Right? It's, it's something so big. You find a human baby in the wild. 
I'm sure if this ever happens to you, you will never ever forget it. Uh, but here he again plays dumb. You might want you might uh, find this useful to play dumb. Here the word dumb does not mean stupid. The word dumb means mute, inya. Act like you can't talk. Right, so here he's pretending he doesn't know. What is this? Why do you ask about this story? Uh, and the first messenger replies, this man, my friend, is him. He was that baby. And of course, this is terrible news. So the herdsman says, to hell with you. In Chinese, it's probably something like Trinimada. Why don't you shut your mouth? Right? Right? Don't, don't say this kind of terrible news. And of course, Oedipus wants to learn the truth. So he says, stop that old man. Don't scold him. It is you whose words uh, deserve a scolding, not this man. And then the herdsman goes back to playing dumb. What wrong have I done, master, best of masters? I assume it's like a pizza. You failed to speak about the child when questioned. So earlier when Oedipus asked the herdsman, like, uh, what did you do with the child? The herdsman didn't tell the whole story. He's talking with no knowledge, futile labor. You, I'm sure you can already imagine this scene, right? With no knowledge. It's futile labor. Futile means uh, useless. If you won't talk to me, pain will make you. So in ancient Greece, it is legal to torture a servant for the truth. In fact, uh, it was often expected that slaves would not tell the truth until you tortured them. Um, it, it sounds weird, right? But you have to remember in every society, there is often an outgroup. Like who people that you can trust and you cannot trust. And this is not based on logic. This is based on social relations. So usually your own family, your own race, your own ethnicity would be in the in-group, people you can trust. People you don't know who are very different from you will often be in the out-group uh, and will be considered untrustworthy. In Taiwan today, the out group, unfortunately, is often uh, Southeast Asian housekeepers, domestic workers. Uh, you might have heard somebody say like, oh, you can't trust these people, or something like that. It's not based on logic. It's simply because in order to uh, strengthen the relationship with the in-group, a society will often uh, disparage qianze, or manma, an out-group, to create a contrast. But again, it's not based on logic. So in ancient Greece, the out-group were the slaves. So all of the negative ideas, negative stereotypes were put on the slaves, including the stereotype that slaves will never tell the truth unless you force them. Um, so this is actually one of the issues of this play. When you have a slave that doesn't want to tell the truth, like this herdsman, it actually strengthens that stereotype about slaves. 
In this play, of course, there's a good reason he doesn't want to tell the truth. Um, but in ancient Greece, um, there was not always that kind of good reason, and slaves often told the truth um, instead of lying. But the, the common idea was that you have to torture a slave in order to trust what they say. So here he says, maybe pain will make you talk. How do I? Maybe pain will get you to talk. Uh, and the herdsman says, no, by the gods, I'm old. Please do not hurt me. Somebody quickly twist his arms behind him. Uh, and you might think, well, that's OK. That's not really torture, right? But remember, the herdsman is an old man. He's probably not very flexible. He's easily hurt. Uh, so this is already a kind of appropriate torture for him. Now, there are no stage directions at this point, but we can assume that somebody in the chorus or maybe on stage, one of Oedipus's slaves goes and does like twist the actor's arms behind him. No, why? Poor me. What do you want to learn? Did you give him the child he asked about? Yes, and I wish I died that very day. This is how much he regrets doing this. And Oedipus says, you'll come to that if you won't talk as needed. To come to that. But if I speak, I'm ruined all the more. Now at this point, Oedipus doesn't understand. Or maybe he has ideas, but he's not sure. So his reaction is, it seems this man is set on wasting time. Uh, but in fact, he had already answered the question, right? I said I gave him long ago. Where did you get him? Your house? Someone else? He wasn't mine. He came from someone else. So one reason why there are so many questions in this play that Oedipus has to ask so many questions is because the people who know the truth know that it is a terrible truth. So they would not be willing to volunteer information. Oedipus has to ask the information in order to get it. Nobody is willing to tell him everything. Except for the first messenger, because the first messenger is not from Thebes, and so he doesn't know what's going on. So when the king asks him, he tries to be helpful. But everybody else, you have to pry the information out of them. Uh, so uh, the herdsman only answers exactly what Oedipus asks. Where did you get him? He wasn't mine. He came from someone else. Which of these citizens and from which house? No, by the gods, no master. Ask no more. But of course, Oedipus has to know. You're done for if you will not answer me. Done for means... Uh, another way to say this is you're finished. Well, it was one of the babies born to Laius. We just looked at this. Uh, I must hear. You should ask your wife. Your wife gave the baby to me to kill the baby. But I gave the baby to the old man, the first messenger, uh, because I pitied the baby. And if you are him, if you are the baby, 
as he says, know that you were born accursed. 生下来身上就有诅咒。Accursed, it just means cursed. Uh, two words that mean the same thing. Uh, everything now comes clear. He understands everything. And he says that he sees everything. In this place, seeing and understanding are the same thing. Uh, I look at you for the last time. I live with those who should not be together. I killed those whom it was wrong to kill. And then we have the choral song, right? Right after Oedipus understands the truth. Um, OK, so let's leave off Oedipus here. We have one more thing to do. This is the end of this unit. The next unit. Uh, therefore, I have to introduce to you. The next unit is the Bible. We're going to spend one week on the Hebrew Bible and one week on the Christian Bible. Why are we reading from the Bible? Because the Bible is not just a religious text. It is also a work of literature. Especially when throughout most of uh, Western literary history or English literary history, people have believed in Christianity. And so a lot of literature, so much literature, has to do with Christianity and religious ideas. We, when we look at literature, we look at the content and the form, right? And we can talk about form usually without talking about religion, but for most of uh, Western literary history, the content, 内容的部分, is connected with religion. So if you truly want to understand a lot of Western literature, you have to have a basic idea of what the Bible is talking about. You don't have to believe it. You just have to understand what people think and have learned about the Bible. Moreover, the Hebrew Bible, well, I guess both Bibles, uh, both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible themselves are works of literature. Uh, they tell stories. They, they have poetry. The use of words and language is also very careful and designed. So we can also read uh, these selections, the Xuanwen, as a kind of literature. So it's important for historical reasons and it's important as a kind of literature. Again, you don't have to believe everything you read. You just have to know what it's talking about. So the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible. Uh, from the Christian point of view, these are called the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, but the Old Testament is the only part of the Bible that Jewish people believe, Yotairan. So calling it the Old Testament is not very accurate for them. It is their only testament. Uh, so today when we talk about the Bible in terms of literature and history, uh, calling it the Old Testament and the New Testament is um, inconsiderate and here for people who don't believe in Christianity. Um, but we can still talk about um, the, the names Old Testament and New Testament. Why are they called old and new? Well, um, before Jesus appeared, uh, 
everybody who believed in this Bible story was Jewish. And so they believed in the older part of the Bible, which we call the Hebrew Bible because it was written in Hebrew, Shibolaiwen. This is the official language of the Jewish people and the official language of Israel today. The Hebrew Bible is a collection talking about uh, from the beginning how God created the world, how God created humans, uh, and then how God treated humans as special and unique and uh, tried to protect them and take care of them in exchange for humans' loyalty. Now, today we think of this God as uh, for that religion is the one and only God. Uh, we call this monotheism, Isandun. But if there's only one God, why did that God have to urge his people to obey him? What other choice did they have? From this, we can deduce that in ancient uh, Jewish history, that society was actually a polytheistic society. There were different choices of gods that people could worship. And that's why the Jewish God uh, so urged his people to follow only him. Now, humans are not perfect, so some Jewish people did uh, end up worshiping other gods or worshiping no God. Uh, and this Jewish God punished them. So uh, the whole story of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible, I should say, is a kind of religious history of the Jewish people, how they began, the important things that they did or did not do, and also a genealogy. There are many parts of the Hebrew Bible that simply say A gave birth to B, B gave birth to C, C gave birth to D for long periods of the Bible. So it's also a document of genealogy. Now the Hebrew Bible is incredibly long and in some parts very boring. So we're just going to read some selections from Genesis, the first book, Chuang Siji, and Exodus, the second book, Chu Ai Ji Ji. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are the holiest part of the Bible for Jewish people. Even if they're not familiar with the rest of the Hebrew Bible, everybody uh, knows what the first five books are talking about. In Hebrew, the first five books are called the Torah or the record. So uh, we're going to be reading about like the creation of the world of humans. Uh, and this the short selection from Exodus will be about the Ten Commandments, Shijie. Um, the basic idea is that um, throughout Jewish history, the Jewish people have been following God's orders. When God tells them to go here, they go here. When God tells them to go there, they go there. Uh, and in one period, God has them wander around the desert uh, because he thinks that the Jewish people are not loyal enough. They don't believe in him enough. So it's a kind of test. And in order to guide them, he brings their leader, Moses, Moshi, up a mountain and there he himself, God himself, appears to Moses as a burning bush, uh, and speaks to Moses and gives him the Ten Commandments, 世界. And he Moses is supposed to go down and 
teach the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people, and when the Jewish people follow the Ten Commandments loyally, then God will know that they are good followers, and he will bring them out of the desert into what's known as the promised land, Inshuzidi, which is supposed to be a place that is full of like uh, milk and honey and oh wait, no, that's Islam. That's Islam, y'all. Uh, that is uh, good for farming and is where the Jewish people can live forever. Now it turns out the Jewish people were not able to live there forever. And that's why the Hebrew Bible is so long. Um, but you don't have to worry about that. For, so for next week, please read uh, the whole PDF of the Hebrew Bible. It's like 20 something pages and it's written in prose. How does it sound when tea? Do you have questions about the Hebrew Bible? OK, we'll talk about the Christian Bible next week. I'll introduce it next week. So uh, that's it. See you next week.